Welcome to Sex Ed for Adults. I am Jessica Ross, a certified sex therapist and clinical trauma specialist. Here on Sex Ed for Adults, we focus on the intersection of sex and everything else. Today, we stand at the intersection of sex and education. A person's sexual health, as stated by WHO, the World Health Organization, is not just the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. It is the state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. This emphasizes the fact that sexual health requires a positive approach that is indicative of respect and encompasses the idea that sex can be pleasurable and safe, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. In Michigan, sex education is not mandated. HIV education is. It is not required that the information be medically accurate, age appropriate, or culturally appropriate and unbiased. And it's okay to promote religion. Parental notice is required, however, consent is not. And parents and families have the option to opt out of sex education for their children. Abstinence is stressed in Michigan. The education is, <clears throat> is not required to be inclusive of uh, sexual orientation and does not have to include the negative outcomes of teen sexuality. Today, I am joined by Sharanda Battle, a God-fearing wife, mother, daughter, educator, and friend. Sharanda stands firmly on her values of transparency, truth, and trust. Not only has she had a wonderful career as an author, a speaker, a life fitness coach, a mentor for young women, she has also had a robust career in K-12 education. Sharanda, thank you for joining us. And today we are at the intersection of sex and education. So tell me, why did you choose to go into education? Um, honestly, I went into education because I felt like there needed to be um, more advocates in the building. You know, um, ed education is, is one of those fields where some people are called to serve and mm -hmm. then some people end up, you know, they happen upon it. You know, a, a different career option wasn't mm -hmm. working out for them. And so people figure, hey, I was a student, so I can be a teacher. Um, and so that is very much uh, not the case, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I just always felt like there needed to be somebody in the building that would advocate for the students' uh, social emotional health as well as their academics. I can appreciate that, that response because I do, I think some people fall into careers and other people are called to them. As an educator, is the topic of sexual health important? It is definitely important, um, namely because I think it's important that we educate our students. We need to start to understand that our children have much more access to sexual, hyper, active, like everything has a sexual innuendo from commercials to cartoons, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we aren't being open with them, if we aren't direct and we aren't making sure that they understand the fundamentals, we, we, we risk the, uh, the unfortunate um, reality that they will make an ill-informed choice or decision mm -hmm. due to their lack of knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very important. Important. And, and they're getting younger and younger because they have so much exposure. Like the age in which, you know, our children are experiencing and experimenting mm -hmm. with sex, just it continues to, to be younger and younger. I, I definitely agree with you there. Do you think then that training in mental health and sexual health uh, awareness should be a part of teacher education when you're going through training and going through, through school? I definitely um, think that it should be a part of our curriculum um, in a much more structured format so that we could ensure or had some type of way to ensure that the majority of our students are learning the same information mm -hmm. around the same times. You know what I mean? Like if you come from one district that is abstinence based and then we have other students who come from a reproductive um, based program where they 
suppress abstinence, but they inform on reproduction. They inform on contraception. Um, those two students likely have a very different view of sexual activity in, mm -hmm. in a whole and in, in its entirety. You know, one is like absolutely not and no. But if they stumble upon it, they don't know what to mm -hmm. expect. They don't know how to protect themselves. They, they've got no idea mm -hmm. unless someone has told them. Um, and so I, I think it's, I think we would be better served if we had a, a standard curriculum. I think that's an important fact that when we're encountered with something, we have to have the tools to combat it, right? And to understand it. And if we don't, we, we make, as you said, ill-informed decisions. How often does sexual health related concerns arise in your day to day when it comes to, to your work? Uh, very frequently. Um, and it, it, it ironically happens a lot of time in the most organic ways. Mm -hmm. You know, you have students who are curious or you may have a young lady that you think you're reprimanding for one reason really it ends up she's been bullied or teased because she's mm. either experimented and exposed herself or she refuses and so she's being ridiculed right mm. so there are so many organic ways in which it's just it's a constant part of our conversation um even you know down to the fact that you know we have students who things happen on the weekend those things that mm. happen on the weekend come back and they're now a part of our school day um, and so, you know, we have, I'm in a K-8 at this point, but, and a lot of parents assume that their middle school children are still too young. Yeah. I've had middle school young ladies with child and they didn't know. They don't know their bodies. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what this change is. They're in the midst of adolescence and puberty. So everything's changing mm -hmm. and they don't know, um, because nobody's talking to them about, the realities of sexual intercourse and interactions. Mm -hmm. And it has to be a lot from your standpoint because we are trying to teach math and arithmetic and, and social skills. And, and now we're saying, okay, but now you need to teach our children sexual health too. We need to watch our children too. And so I think that it says that it's really hard to find a balance in, in what you do, that it's everything that teachers do, everything is, is what I'm really hearing. Um, what are examples, which I think you just gave some, but are there other examples that you could share with us that you face and that you have to deal with and, and, and interact with? I think there, there are so many examples. You know, we have children who, um, as you know, I spoke of earlier, the internet and social media is a, is a whole monster in a world by itself. We didn't have to engage in those things. You know, we have young ladies who take videos and mm -hmm. um, nude or lewd pictures of themselves and share those with people. It ends up in mm -hmm. Snapchat and on Facebook and in these small chat groups. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, it ranges from the smallest thing, you know, somebody screenshotting a text message where they were being explicit and lewd mm -hmm. and now your name's on the message and now everybody's sharing that airdrop is is mm. is the devil um you know you in the middle of class person air airdrops a photo of you everybody in the net network gets it you've got no mm. control we can't find out who it was mm. it's it's a mess uh, but yeah our, our, just the frequency and how free um the access to that type of content is for our students and how um ill-informed they are even um as it relates to them being able to be charged with child pornography you know right. that's a real thing mm -hmm. but they don't know that and when you mm -hmm. are in a k-8 the eighth grade boy who may be in a class with a sixth grade girl that age difference can can range drastically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that young man who's on his way to middle school could potentially be charged much harsher Mm -hmm. than a fifth grader who did it or a mm -hmm. third grader who did it. Mm -hmm. um, so just even them knowing the legality mm -hmm. behind their behaviors and activities is important. 
I agree because there's so many that don't know that yeah you can get arrested you you can be in trouble in legal trouble for sending new pictures of yourself as a minor and then possessing that that creates a problem and they don't we tell children not to do it but we don't tell them well here's what happens if you do because right. we're all mandated reporters right and that rolls you into the system and that creates a whole new problem and we love our babies we don't want to see them in trouble but now we're also obligated because we are a part of the very system and so right. i see how challenging that can be um what do you think your role really is uh in terms of how you disseminate that information or how you even prepare program curriculum or your teachers for this um it is a very tightly tiptoed mm -hmm. line because when you are functioning as a school administrator you are bound by a certain set of laws yourself and standards mm -hmm. you know you can i can't inform a parent that their child has disclosed to me that mm. she thinks she's with child. I can't do that. Mm. But how do I advocate for her? And how do I mentor her? And how do I support her mm. during that very trying time when I am bound by my role in my position, right? Mm. Um, it, it, it's really hard. It, it's hard um, to even help our parents understand for those who opt out to your point they absolutely mm -hmm. have the right and the option to opt out but is that the best choice for your child mm -hmm. particularly if you are not a home that engages in healthy conversations if point. your dinner conversation like how many kids eat dinner together mm -hmm. right like how many families still Almost do that none, right? mm -hmm. I, very few and so if that's not your thing, if that's not how you interact, some parents aren't comfortable talking to their children about sex because nobody talked to them about sex. They happened upon it, right? They mm -hmm. experimented and learned through trial and error themselves. And so even, even encouraging parents to not opt out if they aren't uh, well-versed or equipped to have the necessary conversations is a very tight, it's a tight predicament. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, again, what we want is for our babies to be as informed as possible, but I still can't infringe on the rights mm -hmm. and options, opportunities of the mm -hmm. family. Right, because they certainly do have those rights. And and that a lot of what I hear you saying is, yes, the kids need ed education. Yes, the teachers need to be aware and informed, but the parents are the ones that we really need to be talking to because they are the ones that are really in control of all of this. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. When you come across those situations, how do you handle them, especially because you mentioned early on um, the children's emotional and mental health are very important to you. And so how are you handling these very delicate situations when you're talking to a young person who is 12 and pregnant or experimenting and got caught in the bathroom, you know, kissing or touching? How are you handling it? Um, so from a social emotional standpoint, we we do a lot of conversation about uh, decision making mm -hmm. and problem solving and uh, just goal setting and planning henceforth, right? Mm -hmm. Like the failure isn't the end of the world, you know, making a mistake is not failure, but we've made this mistake, we have this mishap, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. um, your reputation and your name is everything, but you know, it may be bruised, not forever tarnished everybody has a story um mm -hmm. and so basically you know we spend a lot of time trying to build up the efficacy within them um for our young ladies a lot of times mm -hmm. the conversation is just you know you own this space right like it's your body you decide mm -hmm. how you know you think you should behave if if, if it is a student that approaches it from a moral standpoint you know we talk about that like okay mm -hmm. you have a moral code and a compass within yourself so if you are personally feeling convicted we know mm -hmm. this isn't an activity you're ready for and you know just teaching them to listen to that intuition listen to self and then guide self accordingly but definitely um letting them know that it's redeemable if they make a mistake it's not the end of the world i like that it's redeemable 
this really leads into my next question, which is, what do you believe are the life skill requirements for sexual consent, relationships, and uh, the prevention of dating and sexual violence? That's loaded. Um, I think definitely for life skills, common sense isn't common, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, to, to my earlier point, a lot of people don't know what appropriate relationships are. Mm -hmm. A lot of our young women um, don't know what an appropriate relationship is mm -hmm. between a male and a female. If they don't have a father in the home, they don't know. They don't know what that interaction or that engagement may look like or feel like. They don't know what lust is versus love. We need to mm -hmm. talk about that. That They are different. They're not the same. We need to talk about what it means to be respected and to be honored um, as, as a person. For our young mm -hmm. men, you too deserve to be honored and respected. And nobody teaches the boys to respect themselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody tells the young men that, you know what, when you get older, the myth of having multiple partners you might not really like that when mm -hmm. you become a man. When you become a man, you may have a much deeper moral code than you have right now, you know, once armed with, with certain types of information. So just um, I think we, we, we need to do a lot of conversation about what it means to be a, a person of, of good character, right? Mm -hmm. Like what does that mean? Because your character leads your behavior. Mm -hmm. And if we aren't behaving a certain way, then we need to check the type of character that we're building within ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, ev even when that goes into the dating scene and how many of our young women are being trafficked and all of that, like mm -hmm. making good choices. Uh, just because you are able to do something, that doesn't mean that you should do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trying to sneak to the party or meet a random guy because your parents have you know said no or meet a female because it happens to our young men too nobody mm -hmm. talking about it um but what it means to keep themselves safe and what are we trying to protect them from because i think a lot of times our kids see it as us trying to rain on their parade of fun mm -hmm. but what what are we protecting them from and why you know I, yeah. just informing them is, is important so essentially giving them all the information, but that point of if they haven't seen how the relationships inside of their home, if they don't have examples in or outside of their home, those secure attachments, that it then becomes really hard to replicate that in their own lives and their own understanding. But a lot of times we don't give them all the information. And so they're making these ill-equipped, I'm going to say, decisions here, right? Because of that lack of knowledge. And, and it's not because of what they're doing, it's because of our fear as as parents or adults that we we're too afraid to give them the tools because what if they use them right right like, exactly yeah <laughs> so i get yeah. that a lot of controversy surrounds what should be included in sex education including the abstinence only approach what are your thoughts as a my humble professional opinion is that um the abstinence approach is a um, short-lived pathway. Mm -hmm. I think if you were teaching the abstinence approach, it should not, you know, we, we could start it at fourth and fifth grade and some pe somebody's going to be like, fourth and fifth grade? Lord, no. Mm -hmm. Yes. We walk into classrooms and we see all types of things on the phone, cell phones mm -hmm. of students as young as fourth grade, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you are talking about middle school, where they are starting to actually engage and experiment in dating type relationships, mm -hmm. they need to know it all. They need mm -hmm. to literally all of it from what intercourse is, what the potential outcomes are, how to use contraception, when to use contraception, mm -hmm. what type of contraception works for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Mm -hmm. All of it. I think mm -hmm. that we need to start um, all of those conversations mm -hmm. um, 
beginning with middle school and I think it should be spiraled around like you take math multiple times mm -hmm. and it increases in rigor mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. so I, I, I agree with that idea that it shouldn't be a one-stop shop I think my child took it in fourth grade or something like that and, they, and, and it was it was a class um you know with that that's the only time they'll ever get that information any adult i ever seen they go yeah i remember i had that four fifth you know i had that class but they didn't get anything else and then i, I remember having health as a high school student and, and the most i remember from that class is don't have sex right yep. um and and that was really it um so the other part i think is having a, a appropriately trained people to teach the class i think a lot of times right the, the gym teachers will teach the the health class which is awesome it's mm -hmm. great that we we have that ability but now also make sure they have that extra piece that they're going to need to teach appropriate education okay you mentor young women and you mentioned that and i think that's important do you talk to them about sexual health is that a part absolutely of the conversation? absolutely one uh, almost 100 percent of the time mm. um because a lot of the issues and struggles that the young women that I work with have are identity issues. Mm -hmm. Identity issues that are superimposed from society. They have mm -hmm. body image issues. Mm -hmm. um, they have lack of self-worth. Mm -hmm. All of those things that roll into, to the point of the previous question, the selections that they make mm -hmm. in their partners, right? And so, mm -hmm if you don't feel good about yourself and you aren't confident in who you are, then the likelihood that you'll take whatever somebody's trying to give you, as mm -hmm. opposed to having a standard for yourself is very great. And mm -hmm. our young women um, falter throughout uh, the age, right? And, you know, and I mentor young girls from, mid, from middle school to mid, mid twenties and it, stories the same. A 25-year-old woman will have the same issues as one of my 12-year-old girls mm -hmm. because nobody mm -hmm. addressed it with the 12-year-old girl in her. Mm -hmm. And so now mm -hmm. here she sits 25 trying to navigate that and figure it out. And um, it, it, it doesn't get any easier because now you compact some of those poor decisions on top of that mm -hmm. as opposed to being able to, to sit and say, here is your standard. Mm -hmm. um right now and help her build a solid mm -hmm. interaction basis foundationally mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so yeah it's, it's definitely a part of our conversation frequently mm -hmm. and um we you know we, we we sit in our sessions and we just try to figure out okay well what what are you looking for in interactions mm -hmm. because you may just want companionship the young man that you're interested in may want more. How do you communicate that? I love that. Yeah. yeah. I think people don't ask women or teach girls, right, to ask them, what do you want in this scenario? We're often taught to give to what our men want, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're taught that socially, we're taught that biblically, but it's also important to understand well, what do you want? What are you looking for? And how are you compatible, right? Okay, we're down to our last um, question here of our TN. As a woman, how do you perceive being a woman and sex? That, so this is gonna be a, a, load, a piece of a three-part question. The next part of that says, when you think about that then, do you think boys and girls should have different sex education as a result? Um, as a woman, I definitely have gone through stages of what I thought, um, to your point, raised as a young Christian girl, um, it was taboo. Mm -hmm. And so you aren't taught to even have expectations. I'm sorry, hold on. Stop, Stop. be quiet. Um, as a young woman, you aren't even taught to think that you should enjoy that you know the utopia of sex right like mm -hmm. at what point do you even get to have the conversation at what mm -hmm. point is it okay to even ask is how I feel okay like I like him what do I do next mm -hmm. um and so it evolved from that to uh which is part of my mentoring platform um with 
with the young ladies that I work with because I, I am very transparent with them. I went from, from literally zero to a hundred. Young Christian girl can't talk about it, can't do anything to deciding that I wanted to rebel. And nobody's mm-hmm. gonna tell me anything. It was my body. I'll do what I want to with whom I want when I want. Yeah, wrong approach, right? Because that didn't do anything but have me in places where I realized I was actually hurting myself, mm-hmm. sabotaging myself. And so then you get to the point where you start to make standards. And now I don't know if the ones that I'm setting are reasonable. Mm-hmm. What's reasonable and what's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, as you engage and, you know, enter into, into these relationships. So, um, as a woman, for me, it definitely has cycled through Mm -hmm. some stages. Um, and I do believe that for that reason, the classes should be taught separately. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it should be a hybrid. I think that for some content and for some conversations, they should be separate. But I think also if we expect children to be able to engage with the opposite sex about these topics, Mm -hmm. they need to be in a place where they're learning together. So it's not the silly taboo goofiness Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, this is the reality. And so now this young man knows that when I say this, this is what I mean, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. if my lesson was over here, in a in a whole def- different sector when i think i'm communicating something to him that he should understand that he doesn't know he wasn't in mm-hmm. my class mm-hmm. right um and so i think i think definitely it should be a hybrid of both so that they still have that comfort level mm-hmm. to share some of those mm-hmm. intimate things or ask questions that they wouldn't want to ask in front of a peer i appreciate that perspective all right so We always ask a bonus question. Our bonus question here today is, how do you talk to your own children about sex, your own family? Um, I have a 14 year old child Mm -hmm. and it is scary. It's very scary because um, you also, as a parent, don't wanna believe that your child is even thinking about it, Mm -hmm. right? But To my own professional point, I can't let my baby be set up for failure. Um, And so, you know, we ask, what's your interest level right now? Because based on your interest level, my conversation is going to change. Are you just liking them? Are you just liking girls? Or are we holding hands? Mm -hmm. Where have we elevated to, right? Mm -hmm. And so as his comfort level increases, then our conversations become more and more detailed. Mm. Um, But the basic birds and the bees, he knows. The intricacies of it, you know, because we are a family and a home that does engage in healthy conversations, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't have to overwhelm him or scare him. I don't have to use the scare tactic Mm. and, and, you know, give you every herpes and syphilis photograph <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um that you know so that that hasn't been our approach but and what about for the little ones because i you know we both have small boys my boys are whipping their penis out every two seconds and i'm right trying to tell them like, i told okay. you i wanted i told you i wanted <laughs> counseling on it myself because this little one dylan wasn't like that mm-hmm. but desmond is very 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 aware of his body Mm. and what is that like so right now we are on what's socially appropriate hey you can't pull your penis out in public right Mm -hmm. um because they because he is so hyper aware like they don't take baths together anymore Mm -hmm. like no different showers Mm -hmm. because i don't want you to think it's okay to touch other people's private parts Mm -hmm. um so right now it's like appropriate touching and what's a, what societal expectations are. Mm-hmm. Um, but we definitely, you know, don't say um, your thing or nothing like, no, you have a penis, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So we use mm-hmm. appropriate language, um, but even helping him, Dylan, will you please stop? Sit back and stop. Um, mm-hmm. But even having uh, him understand that he cannot touch his penis consistently throughout the day is a challenge like I, mm-hmm. I 
tips, please. I well, I think it's an important point, right? Because they do, they're normalizing, they're aware, and they're becoming familiar. And I mean, a lot of what I do with mine is is a lot of, okay, this is okay, but if you want to do this, go ahead and do it in, in privacy. That's a private moment that you're having, not a public moment. And so we choose our private moments and our public moments very carefully um, and, and still encourage, hey, go know your body, have fun with it. Just make sure you do it in the privacy of your own space, right? Because other people are being impacted by what you're doing and you do have to think about how our behavior impacts other people. So to that societal point. All right, That's so, interesting. Yeah, so they, and they do it, they go and they go in their room and they come back and, and we're fine. <laughs> Just wash your hands. So, you know, it's, it's, it's how it works. Um, so our, our, our wrap up question that everybody answers is, is sex healthy? I think it definitely is healthy. Um, I think it is um, healthy for, oh, thank you. Um, I think it is healthy for um, young people to understand it allows a bonding, it allows um, a opportunity for you to connect with your loved one. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, sometimes you need to know yourself Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and as taboo as that may be i you know i think it, it's still very healthy um part of the conversation and um i think the less the less uh religious that people i think if people remove the religion lens from the sexual conversation, um, it would take away a lot of the angst that people feel about us educating our children. Uh, mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, there is a moral code to it, but on the other hand, it's definitely a safety and health mm -hmm. risk when they are ill-informed. Uh, but I think, I think it is healthy. I think it should be done when you are emotionally ready and mentally ready to engage in such a interaction. Um, and only self, only self can tell you if, if when that time is, right? I, exactly. So with that point being made, uh, is there anything else that you would say or that you would want everyone to know about the intersex of sex and education? I just would say for parents um, to make sure that rather than, um, protect to to look at it from a lens of promoting healthy behavior mm -hmm. you can't mm -hmm. protect them from this it's everywhere it's in every commercial it's in every everything right yeah. so you can't protect them from the reality of sexual activity sexual innuendo you can't it's in their mm -hmm. cartoon mm -hmm. but what you can do is promote healthy decision making and healthy habits and mm -hmm. if we address it from that lens, I think it's more acceptable. Well, Sharanda, I want to thank you for joining me today on Sex Ed for Adults, your transparency and um, just honesty in the conversation are very much appreciated. For all of you watching, please remember to like, follow, and share, and we will see you at the next intersection. Thank you. Thank you.